And if we don't talk about the reality of who you are as a man, you can misuse the strength that God's given you so that your children, so that the next generation can grow up in such a way to impact the world in a positive way. We can use that strength to actually push the next generation away. Hey guys, welcome to the Troy Grambling Podcast. It is an honor to get to spend a little bit of time with you guys. And, you know, each week we try to, to talk uh, about interesting things with interesting people. And uh, sometimes I'm that interesting person. And today is uh, one of those times because I wanted to share something with you that sadly is almost controversial. And it's this question, uh, well, what's a man? or what's a man supposed to be. And I'm not sure why it's controversial because, I mean, if you think about it, men want to be good men. And most ladies would love to be in relationship with, be a neighbor to, work with, right? Good men. But somehow our world's, you know, uh, just topsy-turvy. And what is a man? Um can sometimes be offensive. And I really think as a result, lots of men are afraid to talk about it or pursue it. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. And as a pastor, I really believe that the place we want to go is, well, the scripture, where our creator actually lays out the role that men have, the role that women have, how we interact together. And uh, I've discovered when we do things our creator's way, when we do things God's way, it just works out a whole lot better. At the very beginning, and you know, before we even get started, it's not anything new. I mean, from the very beginning, this idea of the roles that men have and that women have was controversial. I guess really I shouldn't be that surprised because it's, <laughs> it's found all the way back in the very first book, the book of Genesis, there's a question. Uh, and I think this is a question that's very prevalent today. In Genesis chapter three in verse nine, it says, then God called to the man. And listen, here's the question he asks you, where are you? And I think that's a question that we could ask today, couldn't we? Where are you? Where are all the good men? I mean, where are the men who are loving their families, the, the men who are impacting our communities, right? Where are you? Now, in order to understand this, we want to go back even further to all of creation. You know, I, I found this uh, uh, quote, and I think this is true. I know it's true for me. And if you have a man in your life or you are a man, uh, the biggest temptation is to be passive. As men, we are called to, to do some things we're going to talk about in a moment. And most of those things are the antithesis of being passive. They're to, to lead, to step up, right? And when men are passive, bad things happen. I mean, this fallen world that we live in where everything is screwed up is because, well, it's because Adam <laughs> was passive. And you and I often screw up our workplaces. We screw up our families just because we're passive, not because we're bad or we're evil. We're just <sighs> tired, passive, quiet. Listen to what it says in Genesis 3. This is the narrative of <laughs> the beginning of the whole, the whole sordid mess. In Genesis 3, it says, the woman was convinced and she saw that the tree was beautiful, right? Because remember the story, the, the enemy is offering Eve some fruit and she's not supposed to eat the fruit from um, this tree of good and evil. I mean, Adam and Eve could do anything but eat the fruit from the tree of life and the tree of good and evil. But Satan, the enemy, is trying to convince her. And it says it was delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of it. And then she gave some to her husband. I remember the first time I read that. And 
and it even says it, who was with her, and he, he ate it too. Adam was standing right there beside her. He didn't say anything. I, mean, I don't know if he was looking over his shoulder and watching ESPN like some of us men do when we're at a restaurant having dinner. I don't know if he was afraid of what Eve might say or how she would respond, or maybe he thought, you know, I know she really wants to taste this fruit. I, I don't know what he was thinking, but I do know what he didn't do. And remember, he was the one God told don't, don't eat of this fruit. Eve wasn't around. I mean, I don't know if he had told her before this or not, but what I do know is what God had told him to do, he didn't pass along. And as a result, <laughs> bad things happen. And isn't it interesting that our temptation as men is to follow Adam, it is to do what Adam did. And when we do, you know, bad things happen. I'll never forget, we first moved here. We moved from Arkansas 23 years ago. And we had um, started the church. It had grown to the point that Stephanie, who at the time wanted, our kids were little. She wanted to raise the kids. She wanted to be at home with the kids. She's a teacher. So she was able to do that. We had bought our first house. I mean, owned a house. I'm so proud. But then God nudged our hearts and we moved here. I didn't become, you know, move here to be uh, the lead pastor or anything like that. I basically uh, was a parking attendant. You know, I parked cars on the weekend. We were trying to get a young adult service started. But, man, the cost of living in South Florida, it's so much more than in Arkansas. And (laughs) even today, that's true. So that meant Steph had to go back to work, back to teaching school. And she's gone back to work and she's teaching school and the kids are at daycare and I've got this new job and it's incredibly humbling because it's not being the pastor, it's being the parking attendant. And all of that going on, and I'll never forget, Steph came to me one day and she's like, hey, um, I need you. And I was being passive, right? I was there, but not there. I wasn't doing what I, as a man, was equipped to do. And as a result, not only was it hurting her, but it was hurting our family. 23 years later, when life gets challenging or difficult, I'm tempted to do the same thing, (laughs) to go home and disengage, to be passive. So who then are we supposed to be as men? Now, you can ask that question to a lot of people. You can get a whole lot of different answers. But Again, I always go back to Scripture, to our Creator. I mean, our Creator, God loves us enough to send His Son to die for us so we can be in relationship with Him. So I don't think we have to be afraid that He's trying to keep us from really living. I think it's just the opposite. He wants us to live. He even said it, you know. He wants you to have life and have it overflowing. So what does the Scripture have to say about who we are as men. Well, let me give you a few of them. The first thing the scripture says is that you are very good. Uh, world doesn't seem to believe that. I remember I went to chat, uh, uh, you know, AI, and I'm typing in there, you know, asking all these questions. And no matter, it seemed like what I would type in, I couldn't get it to, to say positive things about men and the role that men play in society. And yet scripture does. When you read the first few chapters of Genesis, it talks about God created this and it was good. And God created that and it was good. And God created this and it was good. Then he gets to men, he gets to humanity. And he says, it was very good. Not just good, very good. I don't know if you've heard that lately. I don't know if your spouse, I don't know if your parents, I don't know if your coworkers, I don't know if the person who you pay rent to, I don't know if anybody's told you lately that you're not just good, you're very good. Even if you've made some bad decisions along the way, you are very good because you are made in the image of God on purpose to do some really amazing things. Don't ever forget that. No matter what somebody else has told you or what you read in the comments or what somebody throws at you on Instagram or Twitter or any of those other social platforms, the 
creator of the universe says, not that you're just good, but that you are very good. And he's never given up on you. Now, you got ears to hear what I'm saying, a heart that beats, that allows you to live, and lungs that you can breathe. Listen, that means God hasn't given up on you. He's sustaining your life so that you can still be a man, accomplish what God's called you to do. And I just want to encourage you, if you're a lady out there and you're listening or you're watching the video version on YouTube, pass this along to the men in your life that you care about. Because I can promise you there's a lot of people in their life telling them just the opposite, that they're toxic, they're the problem, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of comments out there. Reality is you're good. You're very good and you have incredible potential. But here's the second thing. You are strong. You know, culture tells us that Men and women are equal when it comes to strength. But we all know that's just not true. I mean, I read a story when I was, I'll never forget it. I, you know, there's a lot I don't remember about being in elementary school. But I read a story about how the emperor has no clothes. And the whole story was about how this a trickster, you know, came to town and he told the emperor that he was going to make him this amazing suit of clothes, you know, that he was awesome tailor. And the emperor's all excited. And so he makes a make-believe set of clothes. And the emperor, you know, he's not sure how to put them on, I guess, but he puts them on. Literally, he's in his underwear. But he doesn't want to humble him enough to say, I think I'm in my underwear. So when the tailor says, oh, they look so good, and they're so amazing, and they're so wonderful. And he's like, yeah, I guess I do. So he goes strutting through town and nothing but his underwear. And everybody's afraid to say anything. And so they all pretend that he's wearing a beautiful set of clothes. Oh, that's amazing, Emperor. You look wonderful, Emperor. Until he gets to the very end of the parade and there's this little boy and he's like, the Emperor has no clothes on. And it seems like in our culture and in our society, we've kind of, we're all walking around in our underwear. And the scripture is that little boy saying, hey, you you're walking around without any clothes on. And so it's important to be reminded of what truth is. And truth is, is that in a lot of ways, as a man, you are strong. You are strong physically, according to the biblical narrative. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says in verse 7, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered right as a sex you are stronger and so the scripture is saying hey you need to be aware of that so that you honor your spouse as opposed to abuse her you are bigger you are stronger therefore you can demand things. You can force things to happen. That's not good. That's not positive. Don't, I, I wrote it like this in my journal, don't use your strength to take advantage. Instead, I'm supposed to use my strength to honor. And if you're raising a young man, I can promise you there's something inside of him that wants to use his strength for good. And if I could take him just a moment, if you're a, like a single mom, and whatever the circumstances might be, I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to look for opportunities to ask that young son of yours to express that strength. In other words, what I mean is ask him to carry the groceries in. Now ask him to uh, check the doors to make sure they're locked. Ask them to do the things that help them develop that strength as a man so that they use it as a way of honoring and protecting and providing for the people that they love in their life, as opposed to using that strength to take advantage or to abuse the people in their life. So you're strong. You're physically strong as a man. But another area of strength you have that often isn't talked about is relationally. 
you're strong relationally. Now, it's different than uh, a lady's uh, ability to relate. You know, ladies are very uh, relational. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. Uh, suitable, it means. And, and that doesn't mean, oh, I guess she's suitable. She's good enough for me. No, no. It means counterpart. The, the same but different. Human but different. In other words, you are able to, to come together. And your re, a re, a relational strength being different than that woman, when you guys come together, it allows you to make decisions that are best for the family because you're relationally strong in a different woman, a different way. Women are relationally strong in one way, but men have a different relational strength, which allows them to, to make some of the difficult decisions. Again, I'm not saying that women can't make um, difficult decisions. I am in no way trying to say anything about ladies at all. I'm just trying to speak to the men in your life or to you as a man and remind you that relationally you're strong and God wants to use that strength that you have relationally to make decisions that are good for the family. It's like when it comes to, um, the Bible, let me just read it in 2.24. That explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united in one. In other words, that relational strength to leave and to cleave, to discipline the children. God has given you a relational strength that allows you to more consistently discipline those children. Now, again, doesn't mean that ladies can't discipline. Of course they can. And many do because often... In our passivity, we don't take care of that. But we should. Why? Because God's created us relationally different from the ladies so that we can, we can discipline in love. Again, the wisdom writer in Proverbs says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, and of course, it's not talking about abuse. It's just talking about corporal punishment. It's talking about physical discipline. He will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from death, my son. If your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. And so as men, you have that relational strength. And then the Bible says with every strength, there's a weakness. So it says in Ephesians, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So don't use that strength to dominate your kids or to make your kids fearful. And if we don't talk about the reality of who you are as a man, you can misuse the strength that God's given you so that your children, so that the next generation can grow up in such a way to impact the world in a positive way, we can use that strength to actually push the next generation away, all right? So you are, you are strong physically, relationally, even emotionally, Right? In uh, verses 24 and 25, it says, This is why a man leaves the father and mother, is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. And now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. In other words, Adam's emotional strength, and when I say that, what I mean is his commitment to Eve provided the security for them to be naked. And you know, when you're naked, you're not hiding anything. We wear clothes. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I'm no, uh, you know, philosopher here, but I just think a lot of the reason that we wear clothes is to cover up what we don't like about ourselves. I feel more confident before you in clothes. Why? Because you can't see everything. It's, and so God has made you as a man strong emotionally, so much so that you can provide in an environment of security that you can both be um, open with one another, right? You, you, you can be uh, free to, to reveal who you both are so that true intimacy can be experienced. And again, if you as a man don't know that, then you don't step into that. And then there's not that security. So there's not that vulnerability. So we miss out on that intimacy. So it makes commitment passiveness or passive men or men who don't understand who they are as men. Bad things happen. They happen in our families and they happen in our culture. You are very good. You are strong as a man. 
And as a man, you are a, this is the way I put it, a cultivator, an initiator, and an entrepreneur. In Genesis 15, it says, now this is before the fall, okay, this is before Adam and Eve, you know, ate the fruit and did what God told them not to do and screwed things up. It says, but the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it, to take care of it. From the very beginning, God created you as a man to be a cultivator, an initiator, an entrepreneur, to, to work in the garden, to take care of the garden, to cultivate the garden. There, there's something in you. And again, that doesn't mean that women can't be entrepreneurs or they can't cultivate, but there's something unique about you as a man that drives you to want to, to, to create something that's yet to be created or to initiate something or to start something. After the fall, it says the same thing. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden and he sent Adam out to do what? Cultivate the ground from which he had been made. As a man, God has gifted you to start, to create, to do something out of nothing. And if you go back and you look at history, so many times that's the role you see men uh, providing. You see them building skyscrapers, digging ditches, going to the coal mines. I watched my dad do that. I watched him start one business after another, after another. Now, if he would have paid more attention to the giftedness that my mom had and the role that she had as a woman, he would have hung on to the money a lot better than he did. But as a man, he had these unique um, parts of what God had given him to do these things. And I'm not saying every man is an entrepreneur. We're all wired differently. But I think if you don't know that, how does our culture suffer from a uh, neutered man who is afraid to cultivate or afraid to initiate or afraid to even start something out of nothing because uh, he's fearful that he'll offend? And so instead, he's passive. You're good. You're very good. You're strong. You're a cultivator, innovator, entrepreneur. You're also a provider as a man. I mean, in Genesis three, it says in all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Talking to the man here. And he says, it will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains by the sweat of your brow. You will have uh, food to eat until you return to the ground. You are a man. And there is a mental toughness that God has given you a willingness to get dirty, to put your hands in the dirt. And again, I'm not saying that women can't do these things. What I am saying that as a man, the scripture reminds us that you were created in such a way to do these things. You were given certain gifts that allow you to do those things. And I just don't want you to forget that because I know that my kids, my boys and my girls and my little granddaughter and my little grandson, they need a world that is cultivated by both men and women, not men who have been neutered, who have forgotten the uniqueness and the very goodness of who they are as a man created by God intentionally to do something significant. In the future, we'll talk about the role that ladies have and the uniqueness that they are in God's creation. But our society has just done a disservice, not only to you as a man, but to the next generation because they've downplayed or tried to hide or even ignore the role you have as, uh, as a man. I Again, I watched my dad get up early and stay out late, especially in times of difficulty and struggle. Maybe like we're, you know, if you're listening to this or watching the, YouTube, uh, the video version on YouTube or, or Rumble in 2023, it's financially challenging out there. And I remember when we would go through times like this, my dad would get up early and he would work late. Why? Because there was something in him as a man that said he needed to provide. And not only did it say he needed to provide, he had the capacity to do that. See, our culture tends to want us to be passive because our culture will tell us that somebody else will provide, the government will provide, that this group over here will provide. And in reality, God says, no, no, you're the man. 
You're unique. You're very good. And you've got unique gifts that allow you to play that role uh, in our society. And then you are uh, a leader. Uh, in First Peter chapter three, it says, "This is uh, it says um, this is how holy women of the old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the leadership or the authority, you might say, of their husbands." Now, in our 2023, we tend to read that and we say, "Well, who are you as a man to think that you have um, leadership over me or authority over me?" and I would just say to you this, we're reading that wrong. We're reading that as if God's given that as a limitation to ladies, when in reality what he's doing is he's giving us as men a responsibility. I can tell you as a pastor, I have the leadership, right, of a congregation, of a staff. What I feel is an overwhelming responsibility. I have a responsibility to to teach God's word. And if I teach it incorrectly or if I get lazy or if I'm passive, then people aren't going to have the tools that they need according to the scripture to live the life that God wants them to live. I'm responsible to a staff so that they are able to take care of their families, so that they're able to pursue the dreams and the destiny that God's created them. And so I can look at leadership as you know, a, uh, a tool that I can use to dominate people or a weapon I can use against people. But that, that's not what the scripture is about. It's about the responsibility that we have as men. And, and that's why the enemy works so tirelessly to get us just to be passive, to just get tired of continually trying to move forward. And Paul, who wrote a lot of the Bible, He's writing to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. And he says, for God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. Again, what's he saying? Adam's better. No. He's saying Adam is the foundation, right? The responsibility, the weight, the one whom God holds accountable. And that's what you think about leadership. It's the one whom God holds accountable. When God comes knocking on the door and says, hey, where's your teenage son? Where's your teenage daughter? What's going on over here? You know whose door, whose heart he's knocking on, who he's holding accountable within that home? It's the man. Again, it doesn't mean that women can't lead. doesn't mean that men are smarter or, you know, any of those kind of things. It just uh, is reminding us that God has given men uniquely different from the ladies, um, different tools that they can use so as to be effective leaders. And uh, you can even look statistically. I, I was looking down here and I was reminded they did some research and they discovered that statistically your leadership as a man spiritually in your home will have a bigger impact on how your kids feel about God than, than the woman will. You say, well, Troy, I don't believe that. Or that's not, well, you can argue with those who did the research. Doesn't mean that men aren't important. Doesn't mean that there are roles that women play that men could never play. But it's important to remember that as a man, you are very good. And as a man, you will be tempted to be passive. You can't blame that on anybody. Be who God has created you to be as a man. Teach the young boys in your life, right? Your sons, what it means to be a man according to our creator. Because his desire is that men and women become one and build a strong foundation in which the next generation isn't running around chaotically in fear, afraid of the future without hope, but 
that coming together as men and women, we would create a world and a community in which the next generation is excited about the future and filled with hope. It's important. You can do it. And I look forward to seeing the homes and the businesses and the community that uh, we get the opportunity to live in and experience as a result of the men and women who listen to this podcast becoming who God has created them to be. So there you go. Maybe a little controversial, but incredibly important. So pass it on to all the men in your life who maybe have forgotten just how important they are, who they are, and the role that they play. Now, don't forget, we're here every Thursday, often talking to interesting people. We've talked to some professional athletes. We've talked to uh, bakers and home interior decorators. I mean, just all kinds of people because they all got stories. And it's from their stories that we learn more effectively how to live our own. So, uh, hey, thanks so much for being here. I do want to remind you that um, we'd love to see you at one of our Christmas services. I pastor at Potential Church, and you can uh, you can go to my website, troygramling.com. You can go to Potential Church's website, potentialchurch.com, times and directions. But we're going to have a very merry Christmas, and I'd love for you to experience it along with us. Hey, we'll see you next week. God bless, and you have an incredible weekend.